Well, welcome to National Community Church, all seven of our campuses. Thrilled that you're here. We're going to jump right in. If you have a Bible, turn over to Psalm chapter 37. We're going to spend our time there. And why don't we go ahead and start uh, with one of my personal favorite verses, Psalm 37, 37. In fact, can we just put it up on the screen? Now let's just meditate on those first four words for a few minutes. I didn't know I was in the Bible until I started reading through the King James Version, and there it is. Mark, the perfect man. If, if, listen, we're memorizing verses. If, if you want to memorize that verse this week, uh, I give you permission. If only there was a comma after the mark, making it a proper noun. Unfortunately, it's a verb, so let's go ahead and start in verse 1. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Little flashback to last week, right? Aren't you so grateful for our campus pastors? Can we just give it up for all of our campus pastors right now? Uh, Last week was awesome. Uh, So grateful for uh, the way that they blessed us with their teaching. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He will make your righteousness, righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him Here it is again, do not fret. Verse 21, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. Now I'll be honest, verse 21 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. God orders our footsteps. I quote that verse about as much as any verse in the Bible, but here's the crazy thing. I don't even think we're gonna get there. But we're gonna get as far as we can go, but why don't we just go ahead and start with verse one. Fred not, we all got that down, right? Next verse. Or not? Do we need to talk about that one a little bit? Um, Fret not. A a month ago, uh, Parker and I took a little trip to British Columbia to visit uh, our friend Bob Goff along with a few of his friends. Uh, He lives in one of the most magical places on earth. He has a lodge in British Columbia that uh, it takes two ferry rides, eight hours to get there. I think the next nearest house is 50 miles away. And uh, when, we, when we arrived, like, here, here's the thing, and I mean this as a high compliment, Bob is not normal. <laughs> he is uh, full of whimsy, and, and I love that about him because I think next to Christ-likeness is child-likeness, yeah. and I'm not convinced that they aren't synonyms, biblically speaking. And so we get there, and the ferry pulls up, and, and uh, would, wouldn't you know it, Uh, a boat comes to greet us. It's a flatbed boat, kind of like the ones that they would have used on D-Day. And there's a marching band. (laughs) I've never seen a marching, with with marching band outfits on the boat playing music to welcome us. There is someone on that boat playing bagpipes (laughs) with kilt. Um... I knew it was going to be a unique weekend, and we certainly had some fun. We did a little Olympic competition. It was kind of like camp for growing up people. Uh, When they did the group photo, man, he pulled a fast one on us. It's like 70 degrees, beautiful weather, and like he had gotten a snow machine. (laughs) Like they use these things in the movies, but seriously, who gets a Snow machine just for friends to take a fun photo. Bob got does. Well, my favorite moments were the early morning devotions. We went down to the dock and Bob would talk about life and his favorite subject, love. And, uh, and he kept saying to everybody who was there that you need to leave something behind. And I'll be honest, at first it didn't resonate with me. I, there wasn't really anything that, that I felt like I needed to leave behind, but by, by the last night, 
I had experienced enough stillness, enough quiet. In fact, I brought a picture just, just in case you don't, um, aren't on Instagram because uh, I think I posted this one. But a um, little picture of me and, and the devotional that I was doing one, one morning. And uh, that's my journal and that's my backdrop. Um, it's hard not to, you know, be still and know that I am God. And, and I think sometimes in the stillness, what God allows us to do is get the white noise out of our lives so that we can actually hear the still small voice so that he can say some things that we don't want to hear, but we need to. And God began to put his finger on something. And it's hard for me to describe, but I was fretting. Now, I would describe fretting as a low-grade fever of fear. It, 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 you could almost ignore it and kind of go, but something feels a little off. And you're not really operating in faith. There's just kind of this subliminal fear. And, and I'll tell you exactly what it was. Um, because the last night they told us to identify it, and I had to uh, think about it and meditate about it and just, and you know what? Here's the bottom line. Our, our, our family's at an inflection point. There's a transition that's happening, and uh, we're getting ready to send our oldest son, Parker, off to college. And I think I've been fretting. I, I think there's been something. If you, if you want to turn that off, you can. It's fine. Um, I'm not going to pick up the electric guitar today and play it. Uh, air guitar for me today. All right. All um, right. So, uh, where, where was I? Yeah, just, I, I don't think I'm ready. Like, just this measure of anxiety, just kind of this little part of me that, well, yeah, 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 we had dedicated him to the Lord. I know that children are a gift from God, and God entrusts them to us, but sometimes we want to kind of hang on to them in our possession a little bit longer than what we should. And, and God put his finger on something in my life, that I needed to let go of. Well, the last night they gave us a rock and, and they said to everybody there, whatever it is that you need to leave behind, just this rock is kind of the touchstone, if you will. You just take that rock and you throw it into the Jervis Inlet. You just throw it and let it just sink to the bottom and let it just stay here. And you know what? Someday you're, you, know, you can come back and visit and then that rock will be there. Um, but just leave it, leave it here. And I picked up that rock I just threw it as far as I could. Hurt my shoulder a little bit. Um, I think I came as close as I've come to, uh, to Psalm 55, 22, which then Peter quotes, cast your cares upon the Lord. I felt like in that moment, I, I took my fretting, I took my worries, I took my anxiety, I took my cares, and I just threw it. And, and I'm wondering this weekend, how many of us have a low-grade fever and we need to identify what it is that we're worrying about because I promise you it's the exact opposite of what the very next verse says, trust in the Lord. And so we better figure out what these two things mean. By, by the way, then it was kind of fun. They have all kinds of little traditions at the lodge. And so uh, one of them is that you sign the bottom of Bob Goff's table, which is just so fun. And, uh, and so climbed um, under there and signed it. But then the last night, um, Bob took some rope, uh, the rope that's on my wrist. Um, I had to ask Parker. Uh, he said it's 550 paracord rope. He said there are seven braids in it. Um, and that it's a nylon rope. But, but here's the deal. When you, when you cut it, when you take a flame and you light it, there's a little spot here where it just kind of, then melts together and forms a bond. And the next thing you know is you have a bracelet that Bob Goff himself kind of did this thing and burned his fingers to, to make this little um, fret knot. <laughs> That's what this is. And you know what? I mean, Laura did ask me when I'm going to take it off. <laughs> I mean, it's been on for a while. Um, but you know what? I, I need to keep it on there a little longer because I need to make sure that I am learning the lesson that God is trying to teach me. This is interesting. This little phrase, fret not, is only found six times in the entire Bible, but three of them are in Psalm 37. Fret not. Now, fear not. 
It's cousin 63 times. But fret not. Uh, fret not. Why don't we start right there this weekend and just try to identify where it is that we need a greater measure of trust. Verse 2, trust in the Lord and do good. You know, that will work in any situation, won't it? That's some of the most universal advice in the world. Here's how I think about it. If, if, if fretting is a low-grade fever of fear, then Psalm 37, 2 is amoxicillin. It's a broad-spectrum antibiotic. Now, there are narrow-spectrum antibiotics that are very targeted towards uh, different issues or problems, but then there's broad-spectrum. And amoxicillin is, is kind of interesting because you can treat anything from acne to pneumonia to Lyme disease to chlamydia to salmonella poisoning. See, amoxicillin is this broad spectrum antibiotic. That's what trusting the Lord is. That's how we relieve this fever that we have. But, but let's get even a little bit more practical. I, 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 let me just come out and say it. Quit complaining. Because if you're trusting the Lord, you're not complaining. Now, this week had a meeting that I've been anticipating for quite some time uh, with Donna Schambach. Donna is the daughter of R.W. Schambach, uh, who in 1960 was preaching revival in Washington, D.C. And how he found himself on 8th Street, I have no idea, but he walked in front of an old movie theater and he prayed as God quickened his spirit that, that the theater would shut down and that it would become a church for God's glory. That's what happened the next year. And the year after that, Fred and Charlotte Hall started the People's Church and met at 535 8th Street Southeast, which is now our Capitol Hill campus. But the People's Church for 49 years met here. Listen, these walls are painted with 49 years of prayer. God's faithfulness. And so I couldn't wait to meet Donna to say, one, thank you, because your father prayed a prayer in 1960 that God is still answering every time our Capitol Hill campus gathers. Now, she told me one thing. Now, she told me a few things. R.W. Schambach lived uh, until he was 85, just a couple of years ago, passed away of a heart attack. And, and she told me that he literally preached until the day he died. His last sermon, they had to carry him up to the pulpit. And 500 people responded to that particular altar call. She said that her father used to preach in his sleep. I mean, I've heard of sleepwalkers. But sleep preachers? Like, oh, sleep worship leaders. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Come on. Um, but then she said one thing, and I, I never meet with people that don't have my journal because I write everything down. And, and she said that she never heard a negative word come out of her father's mouth. And he was a man of faith, and he believed in the power of the spoken word. And so she said he was just very careful not to give any weight or any power to negativity. And I thought, I was so challenged by it that I thought to myself, can, can I, could that be said of me? Maybe, maybe your history would be the exact opposite of that. Wouldn't it be wonderful, wonderful if God did a sanctification work in our lives with our tongue so that we would just quit complaining and, and we would only say those things that, that good, right, pure, just, that the thoughts that we're supposed to have, Philippians 4, would turn into the words that mirror what is in our heart because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. All I'm saying is this. Complaining is a form of fretting. So let's stop it, and let's keep going. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires 
of your heart. All right, this is about to get good. The, the word delight means to take pleasure in, to have fun with, to thoroughly enjoy. Let, let me just ask you, is, is that what you think of? Is that the first thing that comes to mind when you think about your relationship with God? Oh, man, I take such pleasure in it. I, I have so much fun with God. Um, I thoroughly enjoy God. Because if it's not, what, what we need is a revelation of who God really is. The Westminster Catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And I think we get the first half. I think intuitively it makes sense to us, and then we ignore the second half. You ever been around someone who doesn't enjoy your company? I don't really like being around people who don't enjoy me. <laughs> Frankly. Let me put it this way. This week, we're watching Last Comic Standing, and at some point, um, both Parker and Summer happen into the, into the room, and they're watching it with us, and... and at one point, Parker is just laughing so hard. And then at another point, you know, their senses of humor are different. And, and, uh, but at another point, Summer is laughing so hard. And, and, and that night, you know, I, I said to Laura, weren't those great moments? Those are some of the greatest moments when you're just laughing with your children. Listen, I, I love it. I live for it. And so does the Heavenly Father. Okay, he's the one who created you with the medial ventral prefrontal cortex. <laughs> and that's what enables you to do what you just did. It allows you to find things funny. Evidently, God designed you in a way that you would be able to experience laughter. I think we need to steward it, and I think we need to sanctify it. Listen, God loves to laugh with us. God never stops laughing. God never stops smiling. And if you don't know that, then you need a greater revelation of who God really is. I, 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 this is so important. Now, I'm going to come at this through a side door. You know, I'm reading a book this week, actually titled Play, and I'll tell you why I'm reading it, because um, uh, the psalm that, that kind of blew up on me uh, on Monday was that God makes the whales to play. He, they are made to play. And that fascinated me, that this is idea that this, this playful side of God's personality, and he made whales just for the pure enjoyment of watching them play in the water. And so I thought, I, I need to learn about that. And so I picked up this book that Dick Foth recommended many, many years ago and finally read it. And as I read this book, um, there was one interesting little story. Kay uh, Kostopoulos teaches acting at Stanford. And, and the author shared the exercise that she does at the beginning of a semester. She has the students pair off. And then uh, she has each of them stare at each other without saying a word for three minutes. And so we're going to do that this weekend at NCC. <laughs> I want you to turn to your neighbor. I'm just kidding. This is so great because heads were starting to turn. Oh, man, I might have missed a moment right there. Um, you can still ask him out on a date. Um, how awkward, like three minutes with another student that you don't know on the first day of class, like, let's look at each other for three minutes. Um, but she said something interesting happens. One is you get past your self-consciousness at some point. And you begin to study the face. And the face tells a story. Tells whether they use sunscreen or not. There are little, little scars. She said, you tell us someone has had chicken pox. And those scars, then you begin to wonder, what, what's the story behind that? that scar? And there might be some smile lines. And there are different things that just kind of, you know, reveal a little bit of that person's history and character perhaps. And, and I thought to myself, what, what if, be still and know that I am God. What, what if we just took three minutes to look at God in the face? What, what would we see? Well, I think one of the first things that we would notice, we talk so much about the scars on Jesus' hands and feet, but we would see scars all the way around his head. 
And if you didn't know, you would say, what, what horrific thing happened to you? I and mean, we're not even looking at his hands as, or his feet or his back, but just the crown of his head. And these scars tell a story, and what they scream is how much he loves you. But I want to tell you what else you would see. I promise you, you would see smile lines. You would see smile lines on the face of your heavenly Father because you've made him laugh. You've brought joy to his life, unlike anybody else. Because there is, we often say, no one else can worship God like you or for you. Listen, no one else can love God like you or for you. You're his child. And he celebrates that and he loves that. And if we could just learn to delight in him the way that he delights in us. The problem, of course, is, as Peter Marshall said, we're too Christian to enjoy sin and too sinful to enjoy Christ. <laughs> How many of us live right there? I want to challenge you to go all in. I want to challenge you to step into the fullness of who God is, to completely surrender your life to him. And when you do, you will begin to experience the delight of being in the presence of God. And when you do, he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, this is the spot where some of you are starting to get excited. Uh, I think it was last week, magazine was in our mailbox. I don't know how it got there, who signed up for it, but uh, I had to ask Parker what it was, but he said it was a uh, Maserati Ghibli. I want it. <laughs> and that's not what this means. God will not give you the greedy desires of your heart or the prideful desires or the lustful desires. Because he loves you too much. Because that's not really what you want. Not if you want to experience joy. The word doesn't mean give, literally. It's a causative word. It means to conceive. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will conceive in you the desires of your heart. I, I don't know a better way to say this. Um, and forgive me for using this illustration about pregnant women. You per should probably never do that if you're a man. <laughs> but I, I know um, on good authority that many women experience, when they get pregnant, their taste buds and their cravings experience this strange shift. Things that they loved before now cause nausea. Um, and things that really they had no interest in eating before, all of a sudden, guys, you better get up in the middle of the night and you better go get it. Because <laughs> she wants it. There's something that happens when you're pregnant. The desires begin to shift and change. See, when you delight yourself in the Lord, you begin, the God begins to conceive new desires within you. He begins to crucify some of these, those old sinful desires and begins to conceive in you desires that are sanctified by him, that bring glory to his name. Uh, we begin to download those desires that God gives to us. How, how do we do it? Listen, all I know is this, like, you better get into God's word. I said it two weeks ago. I'm going to say it again. You, you need not just a steady diet. You need a daily diet of God's word. You need an IV drip. Okay, you need to lock and load with this book and make sure that on a daily basis, it is nourishing your soul. I'm just going to say it like it is. The more you love God, the more you love the word of God. So if you aren't reading the word of God, don't tell me. And I'm preaching to myself right now. There are seasons where I really can't say that I loved God like I could or should because I was totally ignoring his word. 
But you know what? If you love God, you want more of God. And the place where you get more of God is God's word. And then you begin to consume it. I just have to share this. I need to take a moment to do this because it was such a powerful email. And, and she gave me permission to share it. I got an email this week. Um, try to keep it brief. Just had to say thank you. Um, I'm coming up on my one-year anniversary at NCC. And in the last month, I felt so off, out of step with my faith. And, and I've been praying to figure out what was causing me to feel this way and to get back into the presence of the Lord. Now, I'll be the first to admit my prayers were lazy prayers. And my Bible sat unopened on my nightstand, taunting me at night and in the morning. I, I knew I was stuck, but I couldn't push myself to move. Well, fast forward to tonight after eating more than my fair share of ice cream and feeling the same sadness and void that's been consuming me for a little while now, I reached for my iPad to catch up on the first message of the Psalm series. And for some reason, after the intro video of you in your office, I hit the pause button, I grabbed my Bible and the Psalm booklet that I picked up in church, and I hit play again on my iPad at 11.15 p.m., it is now 4.30 a.m. And I feel compelled to share that I've learned something you've probably known for quite some time, that the word of God satisfies in a way that ice cream never could. <laughs> and my prayer tonight, or this morning, is for my sweet tooth to crave his word above all Else, I love this. My Bible, finally, she said during the Lent series, she bought it because she wanted to do the New Testament challenge and only made it through Matthew and Mark. <coughs> she said, my Bible finally has its first scribbled pen marks. And my psalm booklet now contains my first journaling experience outside of an English class. Come on. Come on, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you, but you've got to download it. How do you download it? You've got to get into God's word and God will begin to download it into your spirit. Let's keep going. Mm. Verse five. And he will bring it to pass. I love this little phrase. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. In 1882, English poet by the name of Edmund, uh, Edward Fitzgerald uh, used a little phrase in a poem, this too shall pass. Now, many people make the mistake of thinking it's in the Bible. It's not. But we'll come back to that. He wrote a collection of poems, um, and he titled one of them Solomon's Seal. And he wove a, an interesting story about a Sultan, who came to King Solomon and asked him to give him a sentence that would be true in good times or bad. And King Solomon, wisest man who ever lived, said, this too shall pass. On September 30, 1859, uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was a reader, probably read that poem and used that little line of poetry uh, in a speech he gave to the Wisconsin State Agricultural Society in Milwaukee. And he quoted that little line, that little story, and then he said, how much it expresses, how chastening in the hour of pride, this too shall pass, and how consoling in the depths of affliction, this too shall pass. I can't help but wonder if that little saying is one of the things that helped him endure the darkest chapter in our country's history and a civil war. This too shall pass. It's a double entendre, which are my favorite. Let's talk about both sides. In his biography, God is in my corner, George Foreman, has a chapter titled, Storms Don't Last. He tells a story about an elderly woman who was asked what her favorite verse was. Now, there are lots of different options. All things work together for good, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Like, I, I don't know what you would think of when I would ask you to 
tell me your favorite verse, but uh, I I love this woman's choice. She said that her favorite verse was, and it came to pass. Things that make you go, hmm. She said, when a trial comes, I know it doesn't come to stay. It comes to pass. That's some good theology right there. And it came to pass. Now, did you know that little phrase is repeated 396 times in the Bible? You're going through a tough time, maybe fretting a little bit, finding it hard to trust the Lord, and it came to pass. Now, it's going to be like passing stones. (laughs) It's going to be painful. But it's going to pass. It's going to pass. But that's only half the truth here. There's a second half. And, and I think it's best captured by Philippians 1 6. He who began a good work in it, and you will carry it to completion. He will bring it to pass. I want to tell you that we have a God who delivers on his promises, every single one, without exception. Not one word were failed. We talked about it two weeks ago. That, listen, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Listen, he's going to bring it to pass in your life if you can stand on that promise. So everything that's not right or righteous will ultimately pass away. And that's why the psalmist said, don't fret. When the evil one prospers, because the game's not over yet. Verse seven, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. I don't have much time. So Let me try to bring this thing in for a landing. Be still. I mean, I automatically think of Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. But but I also think of another story. Um, It's when the Israelites were between a rock and a hard place. They they had um, been delivered out of Egypt um, and, and they're at the Red Sea and all of a sudden, the Egyptians change their minds and they come after the Israelites and there is this cloud of dust unlike anything you've ever seen because these Egyptian chariots are kicking up the dust and the Israelites know exactly what it is. Man, their pulse, their blood pressure just does this thing because God has led them to the wrong place. Militarily, you never put yourself in a place where there is no escape. You do not want to camp by the Red Sea because if someone does come after you, you have no means of escape. But sometimes God will lead lead you to a place where there is no escape so that he can do a miracle in your life. So that he can show up and show off his power in a way that he hasn't done before. Listen, has God not done this in our history as a church? I'll never forget the phone call on a Monday in October um, five years ago when, when... the manager of the theater, of the movie theaters at Union Station said, um, the theater's shutting down. And when I said, well, when? Um, she said, this week. How do you relocate a church like that? And we had no backup plan. We, and, and I prayed. I prayed as much for that message as any message I've probably ever preached at NCC. And, and, and the Lord gave it to me. Exodus 14, 13. He gave it to me. He said, do not panic, stand still, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. Now, I, I got up that weekend, I said, listen, I have no idea what we're, what we're going to do, but I know exactly what we're not going to do. We're not going to panic. We're going to stand still. We're going to stand on the promises of God and trust that he orders our footsteps, that he's not caught off guard when an Egyptian army is breathing down our neck. That he might just open a Red Sea. Little did I know that in 1960, a guy named R.W. Schambach prayed for an old movie theater that would be purchased by the People's Church and that God would move on the heart of their pastor, Michael Hall, to sell that old theater to us. And the waters parted. And we walked through. Stand still. And you will see the deliverance of the Lord. And then Moses says, the Lord himself will fight for you. I don't have time to do this, but 
God never intended for you to fight your own battles. The battle belongs to the Lord. Can I tell you, prayer is the difference between you fighting for God and God fighting for you. He wants to fight our battles for us, but the way he does that is when we get on our knees. And then just this last little statement. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Yeah, easier said than done in this moment with the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. Just stay calm. In 1939, things were not looking good for the Allies. Nazi Germany was on the move. And Britain was about to experience bombing raids, and they knew it. Gas masks, the, whole, the fear, the whole nine yards. Um, and the Ministry of Information came up with an idea. Why, why don't we make some posters? And so from 27 June to 6 July, 6 July 1939, by my math, wouldn't that be 75 years ago? This weekend. They made 2.5 million copies of the poster. Let's just put it up. Put it up on the screen. The original had a Tudor crown on the top and a simple message. Keep calm. Carry on. Now, a few parodies. <laughs> <laughs> Of this, in fact, according to uh, keepcalmomatic.co.uk, uh, 9,053,557 parodies of this particular poster. But isn't it interesting that it traces back to a true moment in history when things were at its darkest? And the message was simple just stay calm, keep calm, and carry on. Oh, but, but wait, because doesn't it go back further than that? It certainly predates 1939. I think it goes all the way back to a moment in the wilderness when an entire generation, an entire nation was on the verge of extinction. And God said, do not panic. Stand still. And you will see the deliverance of the Lord. I promise you, God is still on his throne. He is still delivering on his promises. He is still ordering footsteps. We can still do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And there is still nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. So fret not. Fret not. Not up here. In here, fret not. Let's pray. God help us. God help us. God help us. To download Psalm 37. Calm our fears. Release us from our anxieties. Help us trust in the Lord and do good. In Jesus' name, amen.